So uh, some of you, we went out to Lemon Bay Park a couple weeks ago and we got a chance to, we were out there for what, a couple hours, I think. So yeah, so it was a good time to go out there. Um, I don't know if, I know Jane, I know you were out there. Dennis or Kate, have you guys been out there before? Out in Englewood? I, yeah. I have, a couple of years ago I went out there. Nice oh. park, great place for pictures. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it was, it was great, lots of opportunity. It was a little warm, as you can imagine. And as this time of year, it's getting warmer and warmer. It's hard to believe you wake up in whatever, eight, nine in the morning, and it's already pushing you know, 85 with a heat index of 312. So, <laughs> so we'll have to figure out, what's that? Miguel was there, but has he joined us for good or do you know? Uh, as far as I know, he has. I believe he was in the library and yeah, um, that's how he got his name on the list and everything. So I think he's he's all squared away. Okay. Is there much shade out there at that park? It's not bad on um, once you get in with the mangroves where the boardwalks are. Okay. But and then if you also go to the other side of the park where it's mostly pine flatland with a shell path, that's there's some tall uh, pine trees out there that can kind of keep you shaded. But there are parts of the park where you're just out there in the raw sun and you definitely want to make sure you have a hat and some water and uh, sunscreen with you. Okay. But um, it's doable, I guess, if you go early enough in the morning. It shouldn't be too bad. It is right on the water, so there was a little bit of a breeze when we went last time. Oh, you can actually see the uh, golf? Is that? Well, it's between... I would say it's between there's a there's a waterway between Lemon Bay and then Manasota Key. Okay. So there's a pretty big space of water there, but it's right you know, on the other side of the Manasota Key is obviously the Gulf. So you're getting that that little bit of breeze, which does help. Okay. So again, I don't know if anybody got any bird pictures or anything out there or not. Um, I think we didn't take the time to walk the actual pine trail that goes out in the pine woods. It goes on and on forever. Um, so you might see some birds out there, but we did, I think we saw a couple of sh like uh, water birds when we went out towards the other side where all the boardwalks were. So it was a good place for birding. I said, yeah, give it a try and see. But again, earlier in the day is gonna be better. And it's a free park. It's a Sarasota County park. So okay. there's no cost. And uh, it's, Sarasota, I gotta tell you, they really do a really nice job with their parks. So I've, I've never been, unpleased with any of the parks I've gone to in Sarasota County. Uh, even if you go up River Road, there's Jelks Preserve on the right-hand side heading out towards 75. At the very end of 75, right where the junction is, there's another park. I believe it's South Turtle Preserve. And then if you go and look up Jackson Road or otherwise known as North Turtle Preserve, which is right on the Mayaka River. And that also backs up to Carlton Preserve, to the Preserve or Reserve. I always get the two mixed up, but it's Carlton and it's up there by the water plant. And that's a massive piece of property that they have put away for people to enjoy. And on the back side of that, if you were to actually walk it all, as I understand it, it backs down into Deer Prairie Creek Preserve, which is kind of in Northport on the other side of the river. So, and that whole cluster there, there's quite a lot to see that, you know, it's all free. Yep. Which one is the best that has the limited walking and the most activity? Aha, uh -huh. I mean, I'd like the most. <laughs> Yeah, well, as you know, it's hit and miss. It just depends on the time of day, the time of year and everything like that. But um, if, you know, if walking mobility is an issue, I would not go to the North Turtle Preserve because it's, there's a lot of roots and rocks kind of terrain. It's not impossible. It's just a little, it's just not as flat walking as, for example, the Lemon Bay Park where it's pretty much flat surface all the way around. Mm -hmm. um, Nice park. And then Carlton Preserve, that's also all flat walking as well. But the other one, the North Turtle Preserve, that's that's the one that's kind of rocky and 
got a lot of roots and a lot of really old oak trees, which is if anybody's into landscape photography, I did a couple of my YouTube videos up there when I had the big camera. What about so, Jelts? Jelts Preserve? Yeah, Jelts, that's also all flat walking, easy walking. Part of it is shaded and then part of it is all out in the open depending upon how far back you go, so. Are you saying Jelts with a J? Yes, correct, J-E-L-K-S. Oh, K-S, okay. I thought it was a C. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. And to answer Jane's question, you know, if you're trying to find something that you don't have to do a lot of walking where you might find all kinds of things to photograph, there's always Mayaka River State Park where you can just kind of drive along and mm -hmm. hop out of your car and maybe grab a couple of shots and then get back in. You don't have to do a whole lot of walking if you don't want to go way back into the into those trails in that way. Because I think there's like 60 miles of trails at Mayaka River State Park. So they've also got primitive campsites back in there. Yeah, if you get on their website, they're finding a lot of activity right now. Uh, sign up, sign up uh, to watch the pictures and then you'll know what's a good time to go. Activity in terms of birds or? Birds, uh, raccoons, um, deer. Trying to think, oh, turkeys and uh, what else? Sandhill cranes. Um, I can never find the owls, but everybody mm -hmm. else seems to put the owls up. And there's eagles, all sorts of things. Ra I did say raccoons, yeah. But if you sign up or just check out their webpage, you can see from day to day what people are finding. Okay. Anybody else got any other good hot spots that they want to share? <clears throat> I haven't been there, but I've heard about the celery fields. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. It, they have a couple boardwalks and you can climb the hill if you're really energetic and uh, don't tend to get too hot. <laughs> but it's really, it's good, but they're going to, or maybe they already have pulled the bird feeders. They do it in May. And that was a good site to go because they had fountains and uh, red winged blackbirds. They had uh, the buntings, mm -hmm. uh, the black warbler, all sorts of, you know, different, different birds at the feeder, but you can still go out and find the purple gallinule or Maybe a Sora. Uh, there's some wood ducks up there, but I, I never catch them, but there's, <laughs> there's some little ones up there. And if anybody's looking for a park down south, but not too far down south, that is easy walking. There's always, <clears throat> and Janie's not here. This is kind of in her backyard, which is Six Mile Cypress Slough. Mm -hmm. That's in North Fort Myers area, and it's kind of easy to get to. It's off Six Mile Cypress, and I believe it's a dollar an hour to park, up to five dollars for the day. So depending upon how interested you are in staying there, I usually just drop the five bucks in the meter, and I don't have to worry about you know if I've got to run back to feed the meter if I get caught up photographing something. But there's a lot of um, great cypress if you want to do like landscape of old old Florida. Um, I've seen, besides birds, I've seen snakes in there. I'm not trying to scare anybody. I mean, you're way up on a boardwalk. So unless you're hopping around down on the bottom, I don't think you're going to get bit by a snake. But I've seen snakes, the otters, um, they do have ducks and things like that as well. Uh, I think I've seen a couple of alligators <clears throat> there as well. But, and they do have photographer perches that you can kind of rest and that it's covered and they do have benches and things. So when you're going from one section to the other, there are places you can kind of sit down and just kind of relax. And if you want to take your lunch while you're out there and you know, whatever, uh, that is pretty, pretty nice park. We've been there. Maybe we ought to put that on the list to, to do sometime as a field trip. Um, maybe when, obviously when it gets cooler, we'll see. Cause like I said, right now it's, so our next field trip would be the end of this month. So we'll have to figure out what we're, how we're going to handle that. Who wants to do what as far as indoor, outdoor, if we want to go and just brave the heat or whatever we're going to do. 
Um, plus we got Memorial Day coming up, which is another thing we'll have to think about. So, but we can kind of figure that out as we go. Anybody else have any good stuff going on? Is that Cypress Loop kind of shady? Yes, it's got, you're within the trees for the most part. So that would be easier to do in the summer. Yep. I would wear some bug spray because again, it is a slough. So there is generally, especially in the wet season, there is water kind of gently going through there. But, but yes, that, that's mostly under shade. So it would not be a hard, you wouldn't be out in full sun trying, you know, just baking. Well, I like the idea of the benches and the camera perches. That sounds pretty cool. Yes, you got these multi-level areas that you can go up and, you know, rest and shoot. And then they've even got a photo blind there. Wow. For bird watchers and photographers. It's a great big, it's one of them that's all boarded up, but obviously it's got holes in it. So you could probably yeah. shoot through those or. Huh. Neat. Jane, yeah. were you going to say something? Yeah, if you go, if you walk pretty slow, you can find hidden birds down in the dark spots below the boardwalk. They, if you're not watching uh, closely, you won't see everything, but it's, it's a great, great place to go to. Yeah, we've been there a few. In fact, I used to teach classes down there at the Environmental Center and it's a really, really nice place. So they've also got a, like I mentioned, the Environmental Center where they got like real bathrooms, not some leftover outhouses from who knows where <laughs> that are actually kept up and they do have a uh, classroom there that they do have classes. And they also got nice exhibits and they have a porch with rocking chairs out back, or at least they did when I was there a few years ago. So it's a pretty nice little setup that they got there. And again, the price is right. It's say it's a dollar an hour to park up to $5 for the day. So. Okay, so here's a loaded question. So the um, I like the comment about making sure you kind of look for things in dark spots. So what would be an ideal camera setting in that situation? I, I, so. <laughs> I was just gonna say, it depends, I guess, if you're taking a tripod with you, then obviously you could, you know, maybe use a reasonable 400 ISO, maybe 800 ISO. You know, if you're shooting full frame, you don't have to worry so much about it. Uh, if it's crop frame, then you just gotta figure out what the ceiling is for your camera. Um, that's something to think about. If you're hand holding, obviously, like Jane said, you're gonna need a little higher ISO. If, you're, if you have a tripod, That'll help. Now, one thing, if anybody's ever tried to shoot with a tripod on a boardwalk, this always happens. You get everything all set up and then people decide they're going to walk behind you. And then all of a sudden the whole thing is going like this through your viewfinder. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, well, that's, you know, that's, that's like trying to take a solid picture on the Titanic as it's going down. It's the same idea. So uh, you just let the wood kind of settle down and then you can take your photos, of course. But that would, and if you don't want to take a full blown tripod, you can always take a monopod, that might help. And there is railings around the entire boardwalk, except for one little section. So if you did find something, you could put your elbows on the side of the, the railing and use that kind of as a tripod if you didn't want to carry an actual piece of equipment. That That's might help. Hard. It's kind of long to carry any heavy equipment, the trail. Don't you think? Yeah, I went one time with people who were named Nameless that took a uh, cart last time and it was had little wheels on it was going through the boardwalk. <laughs> that, that was entertaining. Uh, yeah, I don't think we saw anything that day for at least 25 square miles because they the, what was going on with this like da, 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 going down the boardwalk with like one of those, you know, grocery cart things. Oh boy. Well, what can I tell you? It's never boring when we go out. It's, it's always an adventure, so. All right, so one other thing I wanna mention before I forget is, uh, cause somebody had emailed me about the photo show that we kind of got going right now. And if you have not heard, feel free to, if you want to bring a photo by that's framed as wire in the back, we will hang it up here at the Punta Gorda Library. We've got a pretty fancy hanging system. And we got lots of wall space here in the uh, hallway where the meeting rooms are. Uh, we will put your work on display. So all it needs to be is 16 by 20 or smaller framed and with a wire on the back. 
So the question I got was, is there a deadline to have it here to be hung up? So they've already started hanging things up and I was told August 30th. Mm -hmm. So we've got some time, but um, again, if you just have something laying around the house that you maybe did for another show and you just want to reuse it, that's completely fine. Just put your name and the name of the piece on the back. I would tape it to the back of the piece just so that way we can make sure you get what you dropped off back just to be safe. Your August date, is that when there's a specific show or is that when the last piece should come in? That's when the last piece should come in. Okay, so you're going to keep them a while after that. I would say, don't quote me on this, but I think three months. We'll have to double check on that to, you know, for sure. But I think that's what it is. And one more question. Okay. Is it just, is it uh, an exhibition where you put your card on it for a sale price? Or is it just hide your your name and title on the back, what, what do you do? Yeah, you can just put your name and title on the back. And I think I heard them mentioning that they're gonna have a staff member make up like little paper tags that are gonna go below each of the pieces. And I don't know if they're gonna be for sale or not. I think they're more for just for display. Yeah. But you know, somebody says, well, I really like this bird. You know, they can come up to the front desk and say, do you know who shot that or who, who took that? then we can get you obviously the person in touch with that photographer so then they can do whatever they want to do from there. Okay. So, yeah, I've got a few I'll probably bring in. I don't know if you have anything you're going to try and bring. Okay. So Kathy's still working. In recover mode. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So if you got some stuff hanging around, like I said, they did put the word out to also the Englewood Camera Club. So there's a couple of people, if anybody knows Mary Lundberg, if you have not heard of her, she's part of the Englewood Camera Club and she's traveled all over the world. She's a wildlife photographer and some of her work's been in magazines. She does have a pretty massive size metal print here. Uh, I think it's of the, of the sky of a, like a Milky Way type of shot. Um, she does have a couple of bird photos, I believe. So that, you, obviously, if you ever get a chance, you might just want to come and take a look at that as well, especially if you're gonna drop off your stuff, because it's, like I said, we've got stuff hanging already. Okay. Any other questions about the, about the um, show that's kind of going on? When you say title, like we're supposed to come up with some creative name for our picture? You can if you want, or if you're stumped, you can just call it Untitled One. <laughs> There's a few of those. I've never done it. this before, so I'm just asking. No, okay. no, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, if you want to, if you have a, I don't know, picture of a roseate spoonbill that's, you know, posing for you and you want to come up with some rosy in the sun or something like that okay. then that's your title it can be as off the wall or not off the wall as you want so okay it, it don't 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 get too hung up with this kind of stuff i mean any of you have seen my model t4 truck i think i called it old model t i got really creative with that one so <laughs> so yeah don't don't worry too much about the name and i think jane put on the members facebook group about the Cape Coral Garden Club. Garden Club. When does that close or is it closed already? No, it's the end of the month. Okay. The 31st. So yeah, find the link. It's $10 to enter one picture. And I think it's only Floridians involved, hmm. but it can be of their area or any floral or wildlife picture that you have. So it's not expensive to enter. The prizes, I think they're going to give $100 a piece in different categories, uh, 1000 for the overall winner. So it's like 3000 in prizes, I think, or 2800 or something like that. So give it a shot. And uh, also F3C is do by the end of the month, you get on their page and you get the 
it'll cost you ten dollars there. Oh wait a minute. I'm trying to think if if it yeah it does ten dollars a picture. But they they ask me if you're a club member and then they post your picture and judge it. Yeah, that's f3c.org for that one, correct? Right. Okay. That's also up there. I put it up three, four okay. days ago. Thank you for handling all that because I know the Facebook is its own animal. We're trying to keep you know the members straight and all the posts straight and keep all the strangeness going on. Out. Oh, Leon, it spins around half the time and <laughs> <laughs> and you can't, if you make a mistake, sometimes you can't retract it. So what we can do today, if you guys are interested or if you wanna do something else, just let me know. Um, we can talk a little bit about layers because I know some people are asking about layers and how that works. It's kind of like this mystery thing. Or if somebody wants to see like a work uh, photography workflow or somebody wants to share their photography workflow, we do have the Sherry work. I did get that put together that people that sent everything in. Um, so what do you guys think? What, what sounds good to you? I don't even know what a workflow is. So I'd be interested in that. All right, there's one, oh. uh, one vote for workflow. All right, so we can talk a little bit about workflow again, and this is kind of good. And it, this really doesn't matter if you're using, and this is just a suggestion. I mean, we're not putting anything in stone here, um, but when I did this commercially, I can kind of share with you kind of what I did, and then maybe it'll help you. Maybe it'll give you some ideas, or if anybody else has got any other ideas, by all means, please speak up and say, hey, can we do this? Can we do that? And by all means, yes. So. Uh, I can share my screen here in a minute and I'll just kind of show you what I did. Like for example, with the, the Lemon Bay pictures, because I downloaded them off the camera, but I have not done anything with them. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Let's see here. And feel free to interrupt me at any time. So we're just kind of... And put Safari away for a minute. And we can put this away. All right, does everybody see like a whole bunch of folders and looks yes. like the yep. desktop threw up? Okay, perfect. So let's go with this folder right here. We'll put it underneath this word. All right, so basically what I do is when I come back from a shoot, I create a new folder and you can put it anywhere that you can find it. That's what I always tell people. If you have an external hard drive, if I know Fred was here, he tells us about, you know, he has got that cloud storage thing that he did last time. Uh, if you want to put it on your desktop, it doesn't matter. Whatever makes sense to you where you can find it. Personally, I have um, generally, if I'm on the go, I'll work on my computer because I have a laptop. And then later for final storage, I will put it on an external hard drive. And that way my computer hard drive is not getting full, 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 if that makes sense. So, because those external hard drives are pretty cheap. And by the way, I use the SSD drives. They're a little bit more expensive, but there's no moving parts. So if any of you do travel, whether it's you got a Northern home or you're just gonna go out and visit somebody in the US, maybe out West, or maybe you do travel internationally once things kind of start changing here, this whole COVID situation, there's no moving parts to break. So, that's, we talked about hard drives once before, but whatever works for you, just I always tell people wherever you can put your stuff so you can find it. So I create a new folder. I don't know if you guys can see, it says Lemon Bay Park. And then I've got May 3rd, 2021. I just do it by date and by here. Here's the reason why I personally do this this way is for example, if a year from now, I'm like, oh, I'm looking for the Lemon Bay pictures and you can't remember where you put this folder, as long as you can remember the word lemon or bay or park, you can go up here to the search field. And this, I'm on a Mac, but if you're on a PC, you can do the same thing down here in your start menu and do a search for a lemon, bay or park. And then it will then find this folder for you. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So normally this folder would be empty. Let's see if we can get a different looking here we go. This is probably what most people would see. 
is I create this folder called raw. You could call this from camera, whatever makes sense to you or original. So I put them all in here and then I might also create another folder and I'll call it, you know, JPEG, or you might call this web. You may call it Facebook, Instagram, whatever makes sense. Basically your low res versions. If you do any prints, then what I've done in the past is I've created another folder and I would put my ready to go prints in here of any of the photos that I've taken. So for example, if I had a bird picture and I wanted to make it eight by 10, I would put it in here as a TIFF file. That's T-I-F-F. -F. And the TIFF file is a high resolution format. It's unlike JPEG where every time you save a JPEG, you're throwing data away. With a TIFF, you're not losing any data anytime you save it. It's, it's a, keeping each and every pixel. So, and again, this is just a suggestion of how I work. If you got a better way then, or if you had any suggestions, please, you know, jump in and say, hey, what about this or that? So this is kind of where, oh, the other one I generally will have is my layered files, which we're gonna talk a little bit about layers. So then I would create a new folder and I use Photoshop elements. So I have one called PSD or Photoshop document. So if anybody's ever used Photoshop, when you go to save a native file out of it, it will be called whatever you want to call it, .psd. That designates that it's a Photoshop file. If you're using something like Lightroom, this is kind of happening behind the scenes. Um, it's just working through Lightroom. So far, so good. I have a question. Okay. So back to print. Okay. Uh, how did you create, how do you create the TIFF file? When, when does that happen? So what I generally do is I'll start with the picture out of the raw folder. And this is, well, in fact, we can even do this in real time. But basically I will take an image from the raw folder. I'll make it, you know, look the way I want. Contrast, if I need to clone any signs or whatever out. So then it's still in this Photoshop format, which is a very high resolution file format. From that, I can crop it to a specific size. We'll say, for example, eight by 10. And then I'll do a file save as. Oh. And then I tell it instead of Photoshop file, please make it a TIFF file. So then it's actually going to create an additional file that will go into the print folder as a TIFF. Okay, so I could do that within Photoshop Elements. Absolutely. Gotcha, okay. So ultimately, to make this hopefully as simple as possible, you have your original file, so that's one. You then work on it and you have your like master file that's not been cropped, that's two. The second version, and then if you need a JPEG and or print, you would have three and possibly four copies of the same picture, but in different formats. Does that make sense, kind of? So are you actually in Elements or Photoshop? Not, not now? right now, but when we're when I'm working, then yeah, I'm doing this all through Photoshop Elements. And we'll, okay. we'll do one just to show you. It'll make a lot more sense when we do it. Okay. I'll be more than glad to show you guys one. I know that the, the file management is not the most exciting thing in the world, but if, especially if any of you are wildlife photographers and you like to use the continuous high on your camera, you're going, da, 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 you know, 20 frames a second, mm -hmm. and then you get home, you got to deal with all these files. You've got to have some kind of plan, whatever the plan is, to handle all that data. So that way it's not taking over your computer, plus your sanity. Um, one thing I'll do is, I will go through my raw pictures that came from the camera. And the first thing I do is I go through and I pitch all the ones that are no good. Either they're blurry. I stand there and I go, why in the world did I take this photo? The birds half in and half out of the frame, or maybe I took a picture of my sneaker, whatever the deal is, that's no good. So there's no sense keeping those. And I immediately dump those because even though hard drive space is cheap, it's still, you guys still got to pay to store this stuff. So far, so good? Yes. Okay. Now there's a bunch of different ways that you can work once you have your pictures in here. 
Here's basically the ones from Lemon Bay. I've already culled these. I went through and pitched the ones that were no good and got them down to these, these few here. Now, depending upon if you're on Mac or PC, you know, you can double click on these or you can do a preview kind of thing. This is what we can do on the Mac side. And I already converted them to DNG, which is a digital Adobe digital negative. But to be honest, what I told you guys before, what's free is this Adobe bridge where you can point it to a folder and it will automatically show you all the images. I think we looked at this before, if anybody remembers that. Yeah. Let me just minimize this window here. So then from here, you can start making decisions about what you wanna do. Like for example, there's also a loop function in here. So if I take my cursor, and if you see there's a little plus, it's like a magnifying glass with a plus. If I click on the area of interest, it then shows me 100% like a little loop like you might use to see, you know, if the eyes are sharp or whatever in this case, did I get, did I nail the focus? So if this is really blurry, then I could go down here and I could hit the delete key and then it says, are you sure you want to delete this? And I can go, yes. So this is a fast, and then you can use your left and right arrow keys to pretty quickly check your images. So this is a this is what I use, and this is what I've used for the past 20 years. Again, and I'm not, this is a free thing you can still download from Adobe, as far as I know, without having to get the subscription. This is one of the last few free things that they give left. left. If you're on Windows, they have a program called FastStone, I believe. And I know a lot of people mm -hmm. use that and that's also free. By the way, just to let you know, if you're looking at an image and you're like, wow, this really is a nice photo. You know, I did everything I wanted to do. You can look over here to the right hand side. Do you guys see this is F6.3, one over 200, ISO 200. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is all of your settings that came out of your camera. And you can also tell in pixel size how big it is and in megabytes. And there's a whole bunch of stuff here. You know, if you want to know what lens you shot it with, in this case, it was a 70 to 300. I was at 300 millimeter. Um, I mean, you can go nuts with all this stuff here if you really want to. So basically, you can just kind of go through here and then Basically, when you're ready to take one, these are, I thought were kind of cool, except I should have walked up and got rid of this pine needle. I thought that was just the only thing that kind of irked me about that. Let me pick one that's, again, I have not even really done much with these. Actually, I haven't done anything with these. Let me just pick one that might need a little extra work. So right now, Adobe Bridge is reading that raw, it's reading the files that were in that raw folder that you created. Correct. Okay. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. All right, we'll pick one of these. Um, this is one of the paths that we saw. So I can right click on the item and do open with, and I, since I have Photoshop elements, 2021 20, loaded, which they call also 19. I can just say, go ahead and open that, please. And it automatically opens up elements and it passes it to the elements raw converter. So if any of you have played with elements or Photoshop or Lightroom, this probably will look similar. And at the top, you can see it says Nikon Z6. My little thing is in the drop down menu for zoom is in the way. So hopefully you guys can see it up there. It tells you what the camera and everything is that you're you're using. You can rate the photo if you want. You can looks like we can trash it. So this is new. Oh, mark for deletion. Oh, this is a question that comes up. Sometimes this gets stuck to 16 bit. Just know if you use 16 bits that You'll be limited editing in Photoshop unless you have Photoshop CC. If you have Photoshop Elements, a lot of the stuff will be grayed out. So the short version is if you use eight bits, everything will work. Those stars, how do they work? 
because this is a rating system. This is brand new. I have not played with this, but I know in Bridge. Let me see if I can click cancel. If I can get back to Bridge here. For example, if I really like this photo, I believe I can hit Command Five, or that would be Control Five, I believe, on for anybody on Windows. Do you see how the stars showed up down here? Mm -hmm. And then down here it says it's a five star. Or you can do, there's one star, two star. And I'm like, oh, I want a five star. By the way, I have seen people waste away in their editing chair going, well, is it a two star? Because, you know, the <laughs> path is kind of crooked, but, you know, I like that color green. Maybe I'll make it a three star, but I don't know. Maybe this shade of <laughs> shades off, maybe it's a two star. Look, it's either going to be a zero or it's going to be a five. So in my book, that's kind of how I go, but yeah so don't don't get stuck into you know and when you go through them you're going to know which ones you like best i have a program that has a color coded star thing and oh, okay. and then i can't find i can't find it after i save the pictures and move them so i quit using it but you mentioned Fastone, and it has some really awesome stuff being free it has a gamma slider and that's for color, but I don't understand what gamma really is. It's not the hue, but it certainly makes your picture rich. So anybody that wants to look for it, it's under faststone.org. And there's three different choices. I can look up what version I, I have if anybody wants to know. Okay. Yeah, usually gamma is kind of like the, not the highlights or the shadows, it's kind of like all the colors in between is the way as I've been understanding it. Well, it looks good when you slide it. That's all that matters. As long as you know that's what works, and I say go for it. Mm -hmm. So I Spencer, how you get there. Spencer, at, once, at some point during this presentation, can you show us how you go back and find all your five stars? Sure. You okay. Can do that. Also, uh, I, I don't want to... I don't want to interrupt again, but I do have that um, presentation on how to edit in Topaz if you run out of things today. And if, if you don't, I'll do it another time. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. yeah. By the way, I don't know if anybody noticed when we did the five star and bridge, it automatically carried it through here. Oh. This is lit up now. So that did carry through, probably because it's all Adobe products and they programmed it that way. Here's your histogram up here. Um, the little trick is if there's a, I know it's hard to see, but if there's a frame around this, that means it's on. And this is your shadow clipping warning. And then over here is your highlight one. And you can obviously see your histogram here. So this was shot mostly in the shade. So you can see that the most of the data is towards this side. And again, here is your shooting data. I know this isn't really a, uh, this is more of a workflow thing we're doing. If you guys want to see more with raw, just let us know and then we can do it or we can find somebody that wants to do it easy, you know, whichever works. Uh, you can also change the profile that you're using for color. If you want to do that. And then if you click on that little, that little square there it kind of gives you like a preview of what this is going to look like. So you guys know where I'm heading with this. Black and white. Yeah, there you go. So I always shoot in color, but you, you know, it doesn't hurt to, to see how it does go. Now, here's your exposure. So you can see this goes from dark to light. And you know, this is kind of, you can see how the histogram is flattening itself out. And again, if you kind of have a vision in your head and how you want this to look down the road, you can see I got some of this red stuff showing up. Again, that's the highlight warning that's turned on. So it's telling me that this is a bright pixel, in this case, white, probably white up here. So if I wanted to, I could go to my highlight slider and bring it towards the, try to darken those up a little bit to rescue them. So that doesn't look too bad. Why, uh, would, you, why would you do that instead of just bringing exposure back down? Help me understand. Well, again, this is a kind of a personal choice by me okay keeping the exposure cranked up. I'm trying to get some detail in these branches. Okay. Bring this back down, but then this is gonna to start to get dark again. 
That makes sense. Um, okay. But again, there's, you know, any which way that uh, works. So, all right, and then you've got, like I said, all these other things you can play with in here, which is clarity, vibrant saturation. Again, we won't go over all this today because it'd be a four hour thing we'd be doing. Um, here's your sharpening, which automatically puts sharpening in. I personally want to do my own sharpening, so I leave that to zero, but that's my, that's my choice. The other thing you can do with this program, I don't know if you guys can see it going from dark to light. If you hit the P key, P is in preview on your keyboard. This is what we started with, and this is where we're at right now. So you can kind of see as you're working, if it's going the way that you want it to go. So far, so good? Yeah. All right. And again, because I'm thinking black and white, I'm going to push this even a little bit further. I personally don't do contrast in here because I got another tool that I use that we've talked about before. We can go ahead and use it just to show you. So again, if somebody's not seen it before, then they can see it, but you guys probably know where I'm heading with this. If you don't, you will in a second. So down here, you can click done or open. So done means just put the file away with the changes, but you want to go back basically back to bridge or open means, yes, I want to apply the changes and I want to go into elements or Photoshop CC if that's what you're using. And again, Lightroom works basically the same way, except you don't have this kind of layout. It's more done with menu items over here on the right hand side in your develop module. Okay, so to kind of talk about layers, I'm just kind of moving some stuff around here so I can see. If you, by default, this is all you see, and you're like, well, where's all the layer panel go? Um, down, at least in Photoshop Elements, you got these buttons down here in the lower right. You can just click on the one that says layers, and that will then throw this panel up here on the side. So obviously, depending upon which one of these we click on, it depends on what the panel's gonna show. Does that make sense? You always start with a background layer. You cannot change this. This is, it's gotta have something to work with. So this is our, what came over from um, Camera Raw. Now, just to kind of explain a little bit about layers, if you can imagine clear sheets of acetate one on top of another, this is what allows you to do non-destructive editing. For example, I'm gonna make this, it's gonna seem really silly, but this seems to what, help people make understand this. So if I click on this button here, it says create new layer, you'll see it basically puts this, it looks like a checkerboard. Checkerboard in Photoshop means clear. And it says layer one. By the way, if you didn't know this, you can double click on these and you can name it something very technical. Squiggles, how's that? Squiggles. Squiggles. So if I take my paintbrush, and I pick my color, that's fine, whatever color is loaded in there. And I start going like this. Maybe that's not such a good color, we can't see it. Anyway, you guys can see that basically we got this stuff all over the image. But if you look over here in our layer, this has been highlighted. So I can, when I was actually painting this, whatever this Gould's mustard yellow, um, I can turn this on and off on its own layer. If I did not have this layer here, and I just did it right on the background layer, this would actually be on the picture, unless you undid it. That's the basis of layers. If you can understand what's happening here, then you got this whole thing made in the shade. Everybody with me so far? Mm -hmm. So I can even turn off the background layer if you just wanna see the squiggles. And obviously we don't probably want that. So I could just take this, click and drag it on the trash can or hit the trash can and then it deletes it. I have to say goodbye. Unfortunately, okay. I've, got, I've got a meeting at four o'clock that I've got to run to, but uh, glad to see you're using Photoshop Elements. That's what I've been using for years. So uh, I'll catch up with you guys next time. Great. Sounds good, thanks for joining us. All right, so basically we've got this um, that we can do more stuff to. We've talked about this Nick 
add-on that you can get and you don't have to use this if you don't want to but i was talking about the contrast and i'm just going to show you, this is just a chance for me to show silver effects there's another company that's very popular it's called topaz i know some people use that um, i personally have not used it that much because i don't i just don't own it um, i've been using nick for probably 20 years and that's just why i think why i stuck with them it does what i need it to do i don't do a lot of adjusting on my stuff if I go ahead and click on silver effects, if you notice over here, Nick is now starting to create its own layers. So this is a non-destructive uh, plugin. And again, this is why I didn't want to go crazy with the contrast in the beginning, because I knew that I was probably going to be playing with contrast in here. And again, we're not going to, I won't turn this into a Nick class, but basically here contrast, I could do global contrast you kind of see how that's changing and we can even throw the line down the middle. So everything is changing. You'll see over here on the right hand side of the, light on the, of the line. So I could say just amplify the whites, just amplify the blacks. And you can do this independently. And as you move this line back and forth, do you see how it's kind of, it's getting a little bit more depth to the photo instead of just like a white blah. So this is independently going and looking at the whites and the blacks separately. So I've got more control. There is this thing called soft contrast, which I personally not messed with that much. Um, again, this is just kind of fun to go in and play with on your own just to see what you think. And then again, we've talked about now structure. This has a lot of possibilities for structure because of the grass and everything. So you might want to take and just give that a little boost Everything with this is light handed. You don't want to be too crazy when you go to make your changes. Uh, down here, again, we can choose if anybody shot film and they remember putting these colored filters in front of their camera when they had black and white film loaded. This will give you different looks. I don't know, that's, well, that really brought out all this detail up here. That was a blue filter. So I don't know, again, this is kind of a, a personal choice. There is no right or wrong answer. Maybe that looks a little too cluttered. And then we can even go down here and do a vignette. I'll show you another place you can do a vignette and elements that you don't need this plugin. So let's go ahead and click OK. So again, we're trying to do more workflow kind of stuff than trying to get you know me bog you down with every last little thing. Okay, so at this point, this is still in this DNG format, or you can consider this your Canon raw file, Nikon raw file, whatever it is. So we need to save this. So this is basically what's going to answer Kate's questions now about how these files were getting generated. So if I just want to say I like this, I want to save the changes. And by the way, the hand tool is always the safe tool to be on in here because if you accidentally click and do something, nothing will happen. Now, like I had the paintbrush, I could accidentally put more of that lovely gold paint on there. So the hand tool is always the safest one. So I always do save as, and here's another little tip if you didn't know this, see the little three little dots after some of these windows or after these menu items? Yeah. Is anybody still there? Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. So the, the ones with the dots after them means that it's gonna open up a window and allow you to make choices. Yep. The one that does not have any dots after means it's just gonna do something. Right. So for example, I usually do save as, because I want it to ask me what format and where is it going? So I know. So for example, here's this Lemon Bay Park folder that we were talking about. It's right now pointed to the raw file for, or this raw folder, which is the originals. I want to keep my originals by themselves. So because I've already touched it, I'm going to put it in this Photoshop folder. Here it says Photoshop. Here it says .psd. So we'll just call this, we're going to get real creative, path. So there's the .psd we were talking about. And again, Photoshop file format. You want to make sure if you have layers over here going on that the layers checkbox is checked. Because if it's not, it's going to save a composite of this and you're going to lose all your work that you can go back to later. So far, so good? Yep. So we know what the name is. 
we know where it's going and we know what format it's in. So you're in complete control. Okay, so it saved it. Now let's say I wanna print this and I wanna make an eight by 10 print. Okay, so I'm gonna come over here to the crop tool. Now, depending on your, whatever it is you're trying to crop to, if you're using elements, there's this drop down list. You can choose a popular size. Let's say you need 11 by 14, that's not in here. As long as it says no restriction, you can click in here and put whatever you need it to be. So you're not restricted to just what's in this list. You can make up whatever size you want to be. But for today, we'll make it eight by 10 to make it easy. Now, this is where people kind of get a little bit confused. Is this box resolution? What, do, what number do we put in here? What's the magic number? To be safe across the board, if I'm gonna make a print, it's gonna be 300. That's what your printer likes. And that's the traditional printing resolution. If you're doing uh, web work, we'll go back to that in a minute. All right, so now we can take our box, by the way, as you put your cursor inside and you can move this around. And then you can grab these little handles on the ends. And if it's a bent one like this, see, then you can rotate it if something's kind of crooked. So far, so good? Yep. And then this is a photographer's choice on how you want to present the image. There's no right or wrong answer. This is your creative eye, creative decision on how you want this to work. So let's just say I kind of want the path maybe down on the lower third. If you guys can barely see it, but there's lines on my box here. Yep. And that's because down here, I've got this grid overlay turned on and this is your rule of thirds. So depending upon the image you're working with, you can kind of say, okay, maybe you might want the path down in the lower third and have the upper third be more of the branches. Hopefully okay. that kind of makes sense on the thought process a little bit. Yep. Again, there's no, there's no hard and fast rules. They'll tell you there are hard and fast rules, but you do whatever makes whatever it is you like. It's your photo. So go ahead and click the little checkbox, or you can hit enter, whichever. So if you guys can see on my scale up here at the top, see it says eight, and then the scale over here it says ten. Yes. So now it's an eight by ten. The other thing I really love about this program, if we go up here to image, resize, image size, you can double check that it's eight by 10 at 300. This is especially gonna be useful if you're gonna go make a print, I don't know, maybe for a photo show, hint, hint. <laughs> <laughs> so that you'll know this is gonna fit on a eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. Right, okay. That's why I like this versus Lightroom because this gives me the exact dimensions of the final product. I'm not saying Lightroom is bad. I'm just saying that it's, it's just different. So now to go back to answer Kate's question, okay, this, I know I set this up for print. I can do file, save as again. So now I just need to put this in my Lemon Bay Park folder for print. And what I generally do, and this is just me, is I'll put the file name and then I'll put the print size after it. Because let's say, for example, you're at a, I don't know, a um, photo show or something. And somebody says, oh, I really love that. Can you give that to me as a 16 by 20 or 11 by 14? So you may already have a few sizes of this same image just in different sizes, that really helps. I can come down here and say use TIFF. Okay. And TIFF is a safe format that's great for printing and it's not going to override your PSD that we just did. For your TIFF, you generally don't need the layers because this is gonna be a final output. If you want to, that's fine. So I'm gonna go ahead and click save. This really clear box comes up, meaning so easy to understand, right? You get all these options. Here's kind of what you need to know. Image compression, anytime you see the word compression, bad. You wanna leave that to none. 
pixel order, that's fine. Depending upon what, if you're on a PC or a Mac, you just choose the appropriate one. If you forget, it'll still work. It's not a big deal. You notice all the rest of the stuff is basically off. So none, you can leave this to RGB, RGB, and then pick whichever system you're on there and click OK. So now just to show you for a second, let's minimize all this. If we go back here, if you guys remember these folders, we now have our PSD file and we've got our print file in here. Is this making sense now a little bit better? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And when you refer to printing, are you talking about the reason why you made a TIFF file is because you potentially would be printing this like on your home printer? Yes, on my home printer or if you're dealing with a lab like MPIX or uh, Miller's is another big one. They generally will have their what they want on their website. You can take a TIFF and you can make it a JPEG, no problem with minimal quality loss. If you try to take a JPEG and create, you know, put it into a TIFF, you've already lost the information because the minute you save it as a JPEG, you've lost information. Oh. So you want to find, now obviously, like for example, now let's say we want this to put on Facebook. Everybody's going to be looking at this on their phone, on their tablet, on their computer. So density isn't so worrisome. But just check with your lab or like, again, if you're going to print these on your home printer, if you haven't been doing this, you'll find that your, your prints will be really stellar as far as quality and sharpness. Now, if we wanted to make a JPEG of this, what we could do is, or let me get a different, I always try to go back to the hand tool just so I don't accidentally, you know, get crazy, is if I want, now this is 20 megabytes. I don't know if you guys can see this as doc, D-O-C, and then 20 slash 45. Yep. Entire document is 45 meg because there's two, there's two layers. If I was to add a third one, it'd probably be around 60-ish megabytes. So you can see how these can get pretty heavy pretty quickly. Yeah. You don't necessarily need to push a 45 meg file up the pipe to Facebook. So what you can do is do image, image size, resize. Then you can highlight the 300 and choose screen resolution as 72. But as you can see, my width and height is pretty small. So what I could probably do is go down to 150 and that gives me a reasonably sized file, but we're not done yet. So five megs is a lot better than 45. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So we'll click okay. Now we're gonna do file, save as one more time. JPEG and we're gonna choose JPEG from the list. I use Photoshop, JPEG, and TIFF for the most part. If anybody's doing web work, then you can get into some of these other ones, but to keep you know our discussion kind of simple today, those are the three that we'll work on is the Photoshop, JPEG, and TIFF. So JPEG, I'm gonna go ahead and click save. I'm in the correct folder. That's always the thing. You want to kind of want to keep track of where everything's going. So there's been nights where I've probably been up later than I should have been and go, all right, now where in the world did I just save that? And I can't find it. I spent half the night looking for it. So I try to make sure I know where everything's going. Now this little box here, you have the choice of zero or 12. So you see it's a small file, large file. The better, the more this little pin, this little circle on this line is called a pin is to the right, the better your file is gonna be. It's gonna look. So if for some reason you're on slow internet or whatever, you want a really nice looking file without bloating the file size. The secret number is eight. So it's going to compress it some, but it's still gonna look really, really nice. You'll notice if we do a large file, it says one and a half meg, which is not terrible. So we went from five megs down to when we saved it just initially to one and a half meg. But if we choose eight, we're down to 768K. This is 
less than a megabyte. Right. You see where we're going with this? Mm -hmm. Smaller. Yeah. yeah, we went from 45 meg initially when it was layered. You notice that now it's a JPEG. You can see that it's the single layer. The initial uncompressed JPEG is five meg, but we're going to take it down even further. We're going to click OK. And it looks teeny tiny. So if you notice down here, it says 17.82. That's the percent for viewing it at. So we can actually go to, this is actually 100%. And you can see it more than fills my screen. So all yeah. the detail is there. It doesn't look weird. There's no pixelization. So to go back to our finder real quick, inside of here, we open this up. So this is the final photo. I mean, of course we could do other things to it, but you can see, you can even see the detail in the bark. Uh, the detail in the weeds, all that kind of good stuff. Yeah. And this is only like 700, 800 K. So if you needed to upload, I don't know, 20 of these, maybe you're traveling or, you know, you had a really good day, then you could quickly prepare these and then shoot them up the pipe fast. Does that make sense? Yep. I have a question. Oh, Kathy has a question. I have a question. What happens if you take a JPEG and turn it into a TIFF, can you? Yes, you can. So if I wanted to close this, by the way, if you just close this and it says, do you want to make changes to the .psd file? You want to hit don't save. If we were to hit save right now, we would actually overwrite the original high res uncropped PSD with a low res JPEG. So I'm going to hit don't save. So to answer her question, let me just click on open. This is the JPEG version of that. Here it is. If I wanted to create a TIFF from this, I could just do save as. There's nothing from stopping you to saying make this a TIFF. So it loses something. Yes, because we've already did the initial save as as a JPEG and that box came up from zero to 12 and we chose eight. We actually threw away a lot of a lot of information just to make it smaller. It still looks good on screen, but if I was going to print from this, it might be a challenge, mm -hmm. but it can be done. Thank you. Anybody else got any questions while we're kind of? No. 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 Okay. Is it, is it making sense? Yes. Okay, good. So that's kind of, and then you would just basically go back to here and you pick the next one. I know that might seem like a lot of work, but if you're banging through these, you'll be surprised how quick when you get your workflow down. Just because you have 300 tools in your toolbox doesn't mean you need to use all of them to fix you know, your leaky faucet. You're only gonna probably need a presser wrench and maybe another screwdriver or something, a couple of tools. And you'll find that that's what we've done is we've only used a couple of tools in here you notice I didn't, we used a crop tool. That was it of all this stuff. So, and even we didn't get into all the layering and all this other stuff. Again, it's already 10 after four, but um, we got to do the slideshow and all that, but we can get more into layers. If you understand though, that you can add clear pieces of acetate on top of your image, and then you can do stuff to it and that helps protect it. Then you understand layering basically. So, to summarize, um, before you start, I guess, touching up the pictures or making changes to them in elements, are you culling through your pictures using Bridge? Yes, so okay. I'm not gonna waste my time. Um, the very first thing I do is I copy the entire card from the camera into the folder, into that raw folder. Yep. Then I sit here and I go, okay, is this a keeper or a dumper? Um, all right, we'll keep that one. Then I go to the next one, which is this one. Is it, do I like it or do I hate it? And then I make the decision, keep or go. And then that way I'm not hanging, let's say if we go out and we shoot, I don't know, 200 pictures. I try to get it down to like something reasonable, like 20 to 30 items. So that way you're not hanging on to a, 
you know, 180 pictures that are no good and just confusing myself, if that makes sense. Yep. Very helpful. Plus Thank it's you. hard drive space, right? I mean, in the beginning, I used to keep everything. I thought, what if, what if I need this, you know, white egret from five miles away that I shot that's the size of a dot <laughs> or a pixel <laughs> in my frame? It's like, I'm never going to use that. So trust me, you'll know when they're no good. And then you just start dumping them and you'll be, the more you do this, the more confident you'll get us saying, you know what, I've already got one of those or, and you can do a couple of passes. So the first time I'll go through here and I'll pick the ones that are just really, really bad um, for whatever reason. I can just say, yeah, no, no, no good. And then maybe go get a drink of water or whatever it is you'd like to do or put it away for a bit. And then go through it again and go, okay, yeah, that's between these two, um, you know, that one might be a little out of focus. So maybe we keep this one. So then I'll dump that one. So you can easily get this down to something respectable. Like you can see down here at the bottom, it says 30 items. And really it's less than that because some of these are DNGs that, so I've actually got doubles when I was, I forgot I was shooting a Z6 and a Z6 too. And this would automatically natively read the, um, uh, Z6 files. So I really have got doubles in here. So I probably have got closer to 20 ish or less, maybe 15. Like this one here, I've got doubles of this. So I could easily dump one of these just to save space. But as you're deleting, it's actually deleting from your raw folder on your local PC. Correct. It's okay. actually, well, at least on the Mac side, what it does when you hit delete, uh, what's this called? 4366. All right, so let's take the DNG and let's delete it. I'm going to hit, well, let's do it this way you guys can see. So there's a little trash can. Yeah. 4366. So you notice that the DNG disappeared. So to track it down, this is good. We're asking questions. Now, obviously, on the Windows, you got the recycle bin. On Mac, we've got the trash can. Right. Uh, so here it is 4366. Uh. Okay. So it's in my trash. It's technically still there. So if I need it, I could pull it out. But until I hit this button, empty is what we have on the Mac. On Windows, you have uh, empty recycle bin, same thing. Yep. It's on my drive. So it basically moves it from here. Actually, not here. It's actually moving it from this folder. See, there's a big spot there now. Yeah. Into the garbage. Gotcha. But if you go, oopsie, I needed that, it's not all is not lost. You can just go in here and then pull this back out. Good question. All right, now the question Kate had was, is how can you see your five star images? So let's just five star a couple of these. I think we've got two now. We did the path down here. So we've got two. Oh, by the way, you see these little lines? That just means that I've worked on it. So it's telling you that you've touched it. Okay. All right. Now you have a way that you can go in here and filter these out. It's on the left. Thank you. <laughs> I was looking for it. <laughs> yeah, it's been a while since I've done this. So yeah, here you go. You can just click this guy right here. Bang. Now what it's done is it's gone in that folder, which right here you can see the path, by the way. And you can see that we've got, so if you go, if you go through and five star the ones that you really, really like, now instead of working on 30 of these, you might only work on three or four. Okay. So. Good stuff. Yep. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, that helped a lot. Thank you. Okay. And again, this is just, let me do this for a minute. So I can see you guys. There we go. Um, again, that's just a suggestion. That's just how I've done it over the years. But you guys, as you work with your stuff, you'll find the best way that works for you with your system, your software. So this isn't a to be a be all end all chisel it in stone. You know, you have to follow this. It's whatever works for you guys. Okay. Do you guys want to see the slideshow? Yes. Yes. Okay. So let's go ahead and do this again. Let me know if you can't hear the music because sometimes it's kind of goofy like that. 
uh, let's see, enter full screen. There we go. Very nice. Yes. Yeah, good job, guys. It's all can, good. Yeah, it's all can good. You, can you remind everybody in an email, or should I put it up on Facebook, that it was recorded in case they missed it? Probably wouldn't hurt if we did both. OK. Yeah. Um, so after we get a chance to pull this off the server, and then we can put our little beginning or whatever on it, may not even need that. And then we can send it out in the newsletter just to let everybody know that, you know, like Dennis eating, he had to leave early. So this would be a chance that he can pick it up or like Janie who's traveling right now, Shay wasn't here, Fred wasn't here. So there's quite a few people that probably otherwise could have been here. Um, at least now they'll be able to, to see what we went over. Yeah, so Norm had his pictures, like but he wasn't here. Things. I'm sorry? I say Norm had his pictures up, but he wasn't here. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. but this will be good. So like, for example, if you guys have any questions about the workflow stuff that we did, you can go back and watch it again. Right. So it's kind of like having a little class on there that you'll be able to go back and reference to. So will these recordings be accessible um, for an unlimited time? Yes, they'll be on YouTube as far as I know forever. Great. Yeah. So. Does anybody have any ideas off the top of their head what they want to do for a field trip that's coming up at the end of the month? Um, again, I know it's going to be kind of warm out. So I don't know if people still June want. 26. I mean, May 26. Oh. Yeah, May 26. So what, what day is that? Is that a Wednesday? Yes. Okay. Two days after Memorial Day. Oh, yeah, there you go. I'm, I'm, it's daytime right now to me. <laughs> it's yeah, like it'll be nighttime eventually. Um, yeah, I'm sorry? Isn't Memorial Day the next Monday? No, no, I don't think so. Is it? 
Uh, I was already counting on being off work <laughs> on, the, on that go. Monday. I don't know. I'm, I may be wrong. First. Let me see. On the 31st. So it's before Memorial Day. Yeah, it's the 31st when oh. we celebrate. Yeah. According to the phone, anyway. Yeah, you're right. Sorry. No, no, no worries. Mm, no, I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> So yeah, if anybody has any ideas, this is nothing we have to hammer and stone right now, but um, if we are gonna do something outside, obviously earlier the better. Um, Did somebody have some indoor ideas previously? We had thrown around the ideas of like going to like the, and it was kind of like an extended trip, like the Florida Aquarium or going up to the, Museum up in Manatee. I'm trying to think of the name of the Bradington something museum. Um, those are obviously would also be paid things that we'd also have to do, but they're inside and air conditioned. Um, if anybody wants to, you know, if we do something early outside, it's probably going to be manageable, like when we went to Lemon Bay, but it will be warm. We probably have to do it on a non work day too. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, if we were gonna do something um, on another day or it's gonna be an extended trip, then yeah, we would have to figure out another day. But if anybody Monday? had, I'm sorry? Like a Monday, you mean? No. Instead of a Wednesday, what? Yeah, we, we basically, our schedules have gotten changed now that the library is back open to its regular hours. So there you go. If you haven't heard that, surprise, we're no, back I... open Monday to Saturday, um, yeah. 10 to 6, except we're open till Wednesdays and at um, Wednesdays till 7. Wow. And mm -hmm. like, for example, Kathy and I, we alternate Mondays on and off That's oh. to keep it fair. So um, right now we would have Mondays off. But maybe we'll have to do some thinking on this because of the new schedule. Because I forgot about that until you'd mentioned it. A lot of things. So, they cut you to one day off every two weeks, every other week. I'm sorry. Are you only getting one day off every other week? No, we're going to get two days off together, but it alternates Sunday, Monday, or Saturday, Sunday. Oh. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It changes each month. So like this month, we are we would be off Sunday, Monday. Next month will be off Saturday, Sunday. Oh my, that's confusing. But are you off at the same time? We both are, yes. Oh, okay. Right now, oh. until they catch on. They <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> realize what a big mistake they've made. But <laughs> yeah, so think about maybe what you guys want to do if you if you might want to try, like I said, something like maybe going down to the boardwalk. Um, that would be undercover. And they have those photo blinds that you know might be cooler, so we're not out baking out in the sun. Um, that might be an option. Or if you guys want to start thinking about doing something indoors, maybe we can do like a demonstration, like a camera technique or something, where we kind of do like it over Zoom. Um, it's still up in the air as far as in-person programming, what they're going to allow us to do. They're still working on that portion, so we don't know yet but maybe possibly down the road. We don't have any official word, but maybe we could do something in person and that would make things a whole lot easier too uh, whenever they decide that that's a possibility. So yeah, if you guys have any ideas and you just wanna email us, just let us know whatever it is you think and we'll see what we can come up with. Okay. But well, hopefully that was worth your time and effort today. Oh, yes. the YouTube address. The because, YouTube address? Yeah, how, how will they find it? Because I have to. Okay, so let me share my screen again here. Just, that's a great question. So just go to whatever browser you like to use. And then up here, let's type in YouTube. Okay, so let's put in, well, that's interesting. It helps if it goes. <laughs> you put in Charlotte County Community Services. And this is our channel. So it looks like this. If you go here, let's just mute that for a minute. 
if you hit the subscribe button, then as we, you know, if any of you have YouTube, if you guys are logged into YouTube, then uh, it'll let you know when there's new videos being put up. But if you click on this video button here, these are all the videos. You might find some other things on here that you might like, like here's Charlotte County in the 1940s. That might be kind of interesting. I might watch that. There is some youth programming obviously in here. So maybe that does or doesn't interest you. Um, here's another program, this What's Cooking. And again, that was a Zoom meeting. So that's kind of similar to what we're doing now. Um, we also have, like I say, local writers, but you'll see that they'll come up with a thumbnail for ours and it'll probably will say Zoom on it and they'll say, you know, Punta Gorda Photography Group or something like that. Tips and tricks. Tips and tricks. That's the official that's the wording. Name. Yes, you thank you. So it'll be in this list here. Is okay. where it will go. And they might even create a playlist because I think we actually do have one here somewhere. That's let me oh, just yeah, when we were doing our comedy show on the Muffin Church. Yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. Can you search after you find this page? Can you search again for the yeah, you can put in like the word photography, but if you see under playlist at the top, yeah, this photography club, we actually have our own playlist it looks like so okay. here's the ones we did when we did aperture eyes this is when kathy and i were out on the rocking chairs like mom pa kettle it was awesome if you missed it you <laughs> might want to watch it strictly for the entertainment value but um so they will she will probably add them to this photography club playlist under the charlotte county community services Does that makes okay. sense yes yep and, and if you reinforce all that in an email, then what I write on the page will make more sense. Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, we can definitely do that. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, it's good seeing everybody. Hopefully you're staying cool inside your house right now. And it's good, to, like I said, I'm glad that everybody came out to Lemon Bay that had the chance to. If you didn't get a chance to get out there, um, you might want to take some time and check it out. It's definitely worth the trip, you know, go out and have lunch, all that kind of good stuff. Um, yeah, so does anybody have anything else? For a future topic, I'd love for you to um, just kind of talk about what you like about the mirrorless camera. Oh, okay. About mirrorless. And we've also got somebody here, Miss Jane, she's uh, had the experience going from a crop DSLR to a full frame DSLR to a mirrorless. That'd be awesome. And so she, I know I'll just got to twist her arm backwards and then she'll uh, maybe help us. <laughs> mm. <laughs> the same thing. I've also shot the Nikon D300, which is a really old camera body and I had it for a long time. And uh, she's actually let me borrow her Nikon Z6. And I got to tell you, and I'm not saying because it's Nikon or you know, I'm not trying to brand, make it sound like you got to buy this specific brand, but the mirrorless system generally has been lighter. And if you buy their specific lenses that are built for it, I have not seen images like this before in my life. And I'm not saying you can be a bad photographer and take a picture of the concrete and make it, you know, expect it to make it look like the Grand Canyon either. <laughs> so you kind of got to watch what you're doing. But as far as from what my experience has been, um, shooting it for the past, I don't know, six months, eight months, whatever it's been. It's unbelievable. Whatever they've done, the technology is just, in the beginning, I was like, ah, mirrorless is okay. And it, they really needed some time to kind of get the technology down. But now um, I know I've worked with um, Jane and I have looked at a Sony. We've looked at Nikon. I've not personally looked at Canon, but I'm sure Canon stuff is stellar as well. You really can't go wrong these days. It's like you almost need the creativity. You're going to run out of creativity before the camera will stop running out. So, but yeah, we can definitely do that and talk about that. Maybe we can do that next time. That'd be a great uh, discussion. A little bit of news. Uh, I was on with uh, the Lakewood Ranch Group and they had a fellow from Hunt's Camera. I think he's in New York and he presented his view of the mirrorless and we could ask questions. And I asked about the Nikon 200 to 600 lens. And he said, 
Well, it should come out between now and the end of 2000 of next year, 2022. And I, I don't think that's right. But then I saw on Nikon rumors that uh, people thought that they were delaying, that Nikon was delaying all their lenses so that they could get the Z9 mirrorless out because it's supposed to be so improved. Well, they boldly, blatantly uh, denied that they were doing that. They said there's going to be like 18 more lenses coming out by the end of the year. Wow. So I hope. because well, Camera so manufacturers, they want to sell lenses too, because that's really where the money is. It's not necessarily in the camera body. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if Nikon is going to step or any of the lens manufacturers are going to step on the gas and say, you know, we're going to get some of these lenses out. So, but um, yeah, I think that's a great discussion to have is, you know, DSLR versus mirrorless. And for those that want to maybe do a, if you're ready for a camera upgrade of some sort or the old ones getting, you know, kind of long in the tooth and you think you might want something, but I can just say from my experience shooting the Nikon Z6 and Z6 II, because those are the two I played with before, uh, I would need start knee knocking shooting at ISO 6400 because it looked like a static -y screen. You know, if anybody's ever, the noise just looks un ridiculous. But the, the, the Z series that I've messed with, which again is a 24 megapixel full frame sensor, 6400 ISO, no problem. So I, it's definitely um, whatever they've done is massively improved from, but again, I'm coming from a camera that was built back when dirt was invented. So, you know, some of you that have a newer camera, you might be like, oh, it's a nice upgrade, but it's not a huge upgrade. So but yeah, yeah, we can definitely put that down. We can look at some different manufacturers uh, yep. for Nikon, Canon, Sony. Those are kind of the big three and right. there. Now Olympus is in there. Olympus, but I don't understand. They are mirrorless, and but they start at like 200 ISO. I don't know if that's a detriment, but the other side of it is that they are so um, magnified. I mean, a 300 is 600 right away. Uh, oh, 300 yeah. millimeters. Answer. Yeah, so I don't know if, do they have like DX and FX on top of that? No, they're they're using a micro four third system, I think is what it's called. Yes. We can get into that when we talk about sensor sizes. We can talk about that when we talk about the whole mirrorless thing in, in general. Yeah. So add add that Olympus. Um, about sensor size with uh, micro four third. The weight of it is about a third of what the other cameras are. Yeah. Third to a half, if they're good. Kathy, did you have something you were going to tell us? I did. I'm hoping that by the next meeting, maybe um, there, I found out about a, King, a Kickstarter launch for a, a, a product called Inspiracles. And it's kind of like challenge cards for improving your photography. And they're going to have three boxes. Uh, one's classic edition that covers the whole spectrum of photography, landscape edition that will help you capture creative landscape shots and nature photos, and a portrait edition that is made to help you take your portrait photography to the next level. And I personally am going to buy the classic edition when it goes on sale, well, when the Kickstarter launches in five days. So keep an eye out because I think we may try to incorporate some of that. I think it might be fun to challenge each other to follow some of the tips on there. Right. Sounds great. Mm -hmm. Sounds like something fun for us. Yes. Thank I'm you. Glad you're, I'm glad you're buying it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Well, well, maybe. We'll see how much it is. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Because I won't know for five days and 17 hours and something seconds. Can be yours yeah. $5.99 because you got to pay for R&D. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Usually it's pretty good, but when you yeah. do a Kickstarter, Kickstarter, but you never know. Do you think you could include that information on our Facebook page? Or the email? Will, I'm going to make sure Spencer gets it into the newsletter. Great, great. Okay. Perfect. I can do that. And here. 
So thank you guys. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you.